So I thought we could talk tonight about becoming content with our content. By content, I, I just mean our conditioned selves. You know, everything that we've um, picked up along the way in this lifetime um, in the form of, um, I don't know, tendencies and beliefs and patterns and ways of behaving, ways of thinking, etc. So those, those veils through which we live life, um, that whole composite package um, through which we view life, and um, we can just call that content, that whole content of what we take ourselves to be. So we can spend a lot of time trying to um, improve that, right? Well, not all of it. Some of, some of the content we like perfectly well. We don't want to change that. But then there's some other content that uh, we don't like nearly so well, maybe even content that is um, you know, causing us disturbance or suffering or embarrassment or annoyance or whatever level of <laughs> dysfunctionality it's, it's, is happening. Um, and so we, we try to do something about that, right? Um, you know, maybe we try to fix it or we just become resigned to it. Um, or we, you know, sort of pretend it doesn't really exist and sort of hide behind some other, some other um, sort of overriding behavior. For example, you know, if I am a... Um, shy person, I could sort of hide behind some superficial gregariousness, or if, um, you know, I am a fearful person, you know, maybe I unknowingly adopt, um, you know, an overriding facade of anger and um, rudeness to hide some uh, deeper, deeper conditioning. Um, so there's, there's lots of material there that we could work with. Um, but I'd suggest that for many people, the underlying uh, root of it is that somehow as I am now uh, is somehow not, not enough. You know, maybe it's pretty good. Maybe it's, you know, we have a high opinion of ourselves or a low opinion of ourselves, but there's always seems to be a sense of it could be better or it should be better. Um, and for a lot of people, there's this underlying sense of um, really un unworthiness, somehow a deep-seated sense of, um, I'm not so sure I am worthy of being here. My, my existence is, um, you know, I'm not sure I'm worthy of my existence in this lifetime. So, um, you know, this, this underlying sense can drive a lot of this movement towards improving or fixing or sort, sort of changing um, this conditioned behavior that we, that we don't like. So, uh, there, I mean, there are ways to, you know, sort of paper over that conditioning you know, there are workshops that can do that, you know, to you come out of it with a more positive attitude or a um, more forceful, assertive personality. And that may have some payoffs out in the world in terms of, um, you know, career advancements or, um, you know, maybe, you know, the ability to make friends and influence people, etc. But we're still dealing with... Um, working on the conditioning of self and substituting one kind of conditioning for another kind of conditioning. So we haven't really, you know, moved past this um, being controlled by our own conditioning at all. You know, when we adopt some more functional conditioning, sure out in the world it, you know, can have financial and um, different kinds of benefits, but in terms of finding out what we truly are, um, you know, we're not 
actually working in the right arena. We're still tinkering with the conditioning, um, you know, trying to adjust it so we feel better about it. But the real question is, in whose service are we trying to improve this conditioning? You know, in whose service are, is all this effort of, um, you know, fixing our quirks or inadequacies, those kind of things. You know, and I'd suggest what it comes down to is this belief that we are uh, a separate personal self. And that's, 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 what we're, that's what we're working on, you know, to refine that, to polish that up a bit. And um, so the, the useful thing is, is to recognize the degree to which um, we spend our life energy and time um, in that effort. You know, to, to, to really recognize the extent uh, to which we struggle with um, that conditioning in ourselves that we aren't that happy about. Right? How much time and energy we, we spend there. Um, so, you know, if we're putting all of this time and energy into that effort, you know, what we're basically doing is, is trying to improve the content, you know, improve the package. Um, but whether we recognize it on a deep level or e even a, on a conceptual level, that what we're improving is impermanent, namely this body-mind. Um, you know, in the long run, you know, is that the, really the best use of our time and energy? And one of the things that is sort of ironic in a non-funny kind of way is that as much effort as we put into trying to change um, this, let's say, dysfunctional conditioning, um, the, the more resilient it seems to be, right? We, we try harder and harder to, you know, change, you know, a, a behavior pattern or something. The, the more resilient that pattern seems to be to change. You know, for all the talk and spirituality about impermanence, that may be the one exception, you know, the exception of um, being, you know, really resistant to um, changing behavior the more we, we try to focus on it. In a sense, we become more self-conscious about it. It becomes a bigger issue than, um, in a lot of cases, what it probably is. Okay, so there's, um, there's two ways to go about um, dealing with dysfunctional behavior. The first one is applicable when the, when the behavior is so disruptive that it really um, eliminates, essentially eliminates the possibility for any quiet space in our lives, that it's so disruptive. Um, examples of this might be that if we're addicted to drama to the point that it is always happening, that we're always in conflict, that we're always in some stage of manipulating or being manipulated, that it is um, you know, basically a real life ongoing soap opera. Um, another example might be if um, we're prone to anger, outbursts to the extent that um, you know, they're frequent enough that it costs us relationships and then we spend a great deal of time um, in regret or self-justifying thinking or blame or those kind of secondary um, behaviors, right? So again, it can just consume our life to the degree that, um, you know, we n never get to the point of being peaceful enough to really relax into um, an opportunity to, to investigate what we really are. Okay, so um, 
Normally I don't talk about method, but I will in this case. So when we have really disruptive kinds of conditioning, uh, like these examples, um, you sort of have to deal with it first um, before you'll really be able to access a quieter space um, to investigate things at a, at a more subtle level. And um, okay, so here's, here's a method for dealing with it. First, four steps, right? First step is own it yourself. Just, just um, it has nothing to do with the other person, never, right? Okay, so that just, that eliminates a lot of the, you know, possible mental activity. Um, the, the second thing is to just disregard that whole tendency to, um, you know, self-justify, to assign blame, to decide who should have done what or not do what. That whole, um, you know, you know, <laughs> the day after quarterbacking, you know, what should have happened, right? So first thing, own it yourself. Second thing is just to avoid the whole um, blame game. Uh, the third thing is, is to really look closely at um, the triggering event, right? The kind of situation that triggers that characteristic. And the fourth thing, look at the storyline, you know, what self-justifying stories or you're telling yourself about that disruptive behavior um, that you're believing that aren't really true. <laughs> so those four things, own it yourself, avoid the whole blame game, look at the triggering event, try to understand that mechanism and um, you know, really explore the underlying storyline that sustains the pattern, stories that we tell ourselves about how the world should be or how the other person should act or what's right or what's wrong, all of those kind of stories. Um, the other thing about this, uh, you know, really disruptive behavior like this that really grabs us and takes us for a ride is that um, a lot of times it can happen so quickly that we don't even, you know, it's, it's in full bloom before we even knew there was a bud there. Um, but this process that I'm talking about um, can, over time, t tend to see the mechanism more and more clearly. And so we still, when a triggering event happens, we still might not have, you know, awareness in that moment, but maybe instead of it taking months, maybe it only takes weeks to get some clarity about it. Then over time, maybe days or hours instead of, you know, lingering for months or, or longer. Right? Okay, so, and then eventually um, that ability to, to really investigate the whole mechanism um, becomes clear enough that, it, that the, the triggering event may cause an internal impulse, but the lag time has lessened to the point that now that awareness arises in the midst of the event rather than afterwards. So that, that whole, you know, lessening the lag time um, progression may take some time, but um, that will be the direction you know, when we really look closely at it. Um, okay, so that's, um, it, it's interesting to note also that uh, Ramana Maharshi talked about that exact point. Someone um, asked him once, you know, or, or just assumed that um, any, you know, self-oriented um, reaction or emotion didn't, didn't flare up. They just assumed that was the case for Ramana, and he said, "No, actually not. That um, that sometimes that that old sense of self does does arise, does flare up, but um, you know it's noticed, it's recognized, um, you know, before it, it um, blossoms into 
speech or behavior. Okay, so even someone as advanced as Ramana, you know, still, still um, may be subject to patterns, but the, the depth of the investigation was such that um, he could catch it in the moment rather than after the reaction. Okay, so that's we've, what we've been talking about so far is, is just, you know, really um, disruptive kind of behaviors that, re that really consume, you know, huge chunks of energy from our life. So those may require, you know, um, concerted effort over a period of time just to deal with them, just to, just to reduce them to the level, um, to a manageable level, right? Okay, they may, they may still arise occasionally, that's okay. Every time they arise, there's another opportunity to see it a little bit more clearly. Okay, but then there's all those other behaviors that you know, we might not really care for or we might think are sort of annoying or awkward or embarrassing. I mean, they're not you know, totally, um, you know, where we don't totally blow it, but um, they're, they're still not that fun. So, um, you know, rather than making this whole life about, you know, improving this, how we respond to situations or, you know, the, the conditionings that we, that we function under, um, rather than devoting our life to this, you know, lifelong self-improvement game, as if somehow, um, you know, we have to earn our way uh, to the point of um, being eligible for awakening, or we have to, or even worse, we have to, you know, thinking that we can earn our way all the way to awakening, you know, like it's, it's all about improving ourselves more and more and more, and then one day that we arrive at this distant goal. But it, it's not really that at all. Um, what we can do, the, the whole purpose of getting rid of, you know, seeing through the use, uh, disruptive behaviors and also any kind of milder form of conditioning, um, one of the secrets is not to oppose it, right? If we oppose it, um, first of all, we energize it. Um, but second of all, we uh, are no longer in a, an objective position to really understand it because we have an agenda. You know, we want to get rid of it sooner the better. Right? So we're not um, really looking objectively at all. We're trying to manipulate it. You know, this is, uh, you know, our crafty minds trying to, trying to fix things, improve things. Um, when what is really required is that we understand things. So what I'm getting at for these, you know, sort of milder forms of conditioning that we're not that fond of is rather than trying to, you know, continue to work at this um, self-improvement game that perhaps many of us have been, um, have spent a lot of time and energy on, is that it is more efficient to recognize what we truly are first. So this is the, you know, one of the, the first step in the Buddhist tradition, um, right view, right? Right view, right perspective, right, um, you know, to discover the place from which we are looking, right view, um, is, is this awareness that we pointed to at the beginning. So if we discover that, discover that essence of what we truly are, um, these other sort of milder, not so functional content, um, we can look look at it from the perspective of awareness 
and it just doesn't seem that significant. Still, it's still there, still may be operational, but there's a recognition that it's not truly who we are. Um, and that changes everything um, because that further allows us to look at it um, much more objectively, just to see, yeah, that's, that's how this body-mind got conditioned. You know, other body-minds got conditioned in other ways, but we all got thoroughly conditioned, and no doubt about it. So, um, f from this point of uh, awareness and looking at this conditioning, um, again, don't oppose it. Don't try to, um, you know, look at it with the goal of trying to make it go away. Much more productive to look at it from the perspective of, I, I, I really want to understand how this is happening. I want to understand the basis for it. Um, I want to understand, you know, my beliefs that are holding it in place, that are sustaining it. And so this isn't um, a goal-oriented exercise. It's just a curiosity. It's like from from this awareness, just looking at how this body-mind evolved and um, with some curiosity. Like, you, you got to live through it and now you, there's an opportunity to really look at that with some, with some tenderness, really, um, and in depth, um, to really understand it. But to understand it from a, a gentle, point of view rather than just wanting it to go away, wanting it to be fixed. Um, so what we're talking about here is coming to the point of being content with your content, right? Being okay with it. Doesn't mean you have to like it all, but just being okay with it. And um, because our, our task is really to see what's actually true, not just to um, try to m manipulate how we look at things so it's, everything looks more pleasant. You know, if, if our goal is really sincere, it's really to find out what, what is true, what is true about this life, what is true about um, what I really am, what is true about you know, what is actually living this life? Those kind of questions. Okay. But, you know, when we're, when we're focused on and using all our life energy and time, both of which we have in limited quantities, and we're using it all to fix or improve um, this conditioned self, when the conditioned self itself is impermanent. We know that, right? So if we took that same energy um, and instead of putting it into something that's impermanent, you know, why not invest it in something that um, we may discover is not impermanent? You know, to really discover what, what that is and the possibility there. So we can, you know, spend a great deal of time focused on trying to improve or fix. In, in the Buddhist tradition, they talk about the four pairs of mundane concern. I've spoken about this before, but um, they're revealing, right? Okay, here are the four pairs. In Buddhism, they like to count everything. So here we have four pairs of mundane concern. So we have gain and loss, praise and blame, pleasure and pain, fame and disrepute. Right? Four pairs of mundane concern. Again, gain and loss, praise and blame, pleasure and pain, fame and disrepute. Okay, so we can just, I don't know, think back on our own lives and 
consider the amount of energy and worry and planning and hope and desire and fear that go into these four pairs of mundane concerns? How much of our life energy is spent in service to those? Okay, so when, when we talk about, um, I don't know, the fundamental nature of awareness, um, it's not to dismiss the significance of this body-mind. Body-mind is an amazing, amazing crea creation, right? It's a, a total wonder. Um, so we're not as in you know, some spiritual traditions trying to denigrate the body-mind or <laughs> dismiss its existence altogether. Um, but it's really to put things in the proper perspective. And that is that the awareness is primary. Without the awareness, we'd have no knowledge of anything. There'd be no, no experience of anything. We wouldn't know whether the world existed or not. We wouldn't know whether we existed or not. We wouldn't know. <laughs> we wouldn't know anything. <laughs> there would be nothing there to know anything. So this awareness is primary. But it's not to say that um, the, the body-mind uh, is not also present, um, but where it its presence is recognized is within awareness. Therefore, we can say that the awareness is primary. But the, the actual um, experience of that is that there is something that, um, uh, that's a perceiver of whatever objects are arising in awareness, um, in this case, awareness itself. Um, there's also the function of perceiving, right? And then there's the object that's being perceived. Okay, so um, in, let's just take this uh, sense of sight. There's um, that which recognizes what is seen, which is the awareness. There's the um, sensory process of seeing, and then there's the object that is seen. Right. So when we're talking about the, the body-mind, there's the awareness, um, there's the um, recognition of the presence of this body-mind, and then there's the object of uh, that awareness, which is the body-mind itself. Okay, so in our mind, in our mental capacity, we can divide this up in three. Perceiver, perceiving, perceived. But the actual experience of that is, um, it's, it's all one phenomena. There's not actually a distinction, a fundamental distinction, um, because it all, it all arises as one phenomena. So the, the awareness um, and the uh, any object that's arising within that and the noticing of it is all, all one movement. Right, so in that sense, what arises within awareness is actually mm, essentially um, not separate from the awareness itself. You know, so even though we can say that awareness is primary, it's also not to um, diminish in any way the significance of this body-mind. And what we eventually come to is to recognize that it is um, the awareness itself that is both enlivening and living through and as um, this body-mind. So in any attempt to um, fundamentally differentiate those two things, awareness and the body, um, we become 
something other than non-dual, right? Where we compartmentalize our actual experience, that this is more true. And that is somehow outside the arena of truth. But outside the arena of truth is not actually possible. It is everything is experienced through awareness and therefore given, given reality as a result of that awareness. So that, that awareness itself is, is primary. So when we first encounter this awareness from the perspective of mind, um, it, can, it can look like an absence because what we thought was running the show, this separate self, um, we discover is, was just an idea, just a misun misunderstanding of what was actually happening. The, the awareness has always been um, what has enlivened us and has been living life through and as us. We, but there's just this patterning in our head that um, somehow there's a individual separate self in there somewhere um, that is um, the doer of our deeds and the thinker of our thoughts, right? We, we assume that that entity is in there somewhere. When we go to look for it, it's surprisingly hard to find, but that assumption is there. And then one day, um, perhaps when we discover that that is not actually true, um, suddenly there's a, a curious absence, like what I thought I was, suddenly I'm not. <laughs> never was, but it can be surprising. It, it can even be a little disturbing and, you know, for some people to suddenly feel the absence of what we thought we were. It's not, nothing has actually died or, you know, been removed from what you essentially are. It's just an idea, a belief that has been Terminated, <laughs> an illusion that has been seen through. That's it. But the sense of it can be like suddenly there's this absence of what I thought I was, but there is this immense spaciousness, this openness um, that's always been there, but suddenly we take note of it. From the point of view of the mind, that, that spaciousness can look like um, absence and emptiness, but that's, that's the mind looking at it. The actual experience from being you know, fully immersed in that awareness is, is good, right? It's expansive, it's freeing, it's quiet, it's already at peace. It's not judging any of us. It's not telling us what we should or shouldn't do. Like a scolding parent. You know, so it's not, it's not that um, voice in our head that is you know, always trying to tell us to do the right thing or things that we should do or shouldn't do. Not, it's not that voice at all. It's just, it's just the openness, um, the presence, the spaciousness to um, whatever arises. So that's, that's actually the freedom of it. Um, and that we, when we first discover it, it, it can feel like it is my personal awareness. You know, it's almost like my little awareness bubble around this body-mind, you know, extending, I don't know, some, some limited distance. 
and then that person over there has their own awareness bubble. But then we can see that that is, again, just a, a belief that is residual from probably being taught back in biology class in high school that consciousness arises from brain cell activity. But when we really sense into it, um, we begin to discover that it is not, um, it's not generated personally. We don't have that ability. <laughs> we, it, it's something that um, that is the very fabric of life itself, that is actually what, it, what enlivens us. Um, it is what is the essence of what is living this life. And that's the, the beauty of it, to come into that understanding and to um, you know, relinquish this false sense of you know, personal doership, like me as a separate person apart from all of that life out there and to come to the re realization that it is actually one life being lived in millions and millions of forms through each of us, expressed in many, many different ways. Not just humans, right? Everything. And so that, when we sense into that, that's actually um, the basis for a feeling of unity with, with life, with ourselves, with others, is that fundamental understanding that that awareness is um, fully functional in everyone, like everyone with no exceptions, um, and expressed in different ways, some functional, some less so, some clear, more clear, some less so. But, you know, some confused, yes, but it's still that fundamental life energy is still the underlying commonality there. So we can focus on the differences or we could focus on, you know, sort of the essential nature of what we all are. When we can see the fundamental nature that we ourselves are, we can sense into that same awareness in everyone. Um, and there can be a compassion when that energy is filtered through um, a confused set of beliefs, you know, that causes uh, people to act in ways that um, don't recognize that fundamental unity. So we act in ways that cause each other to suffer, mostly unnecessarily. You know, so this, this movement of um, compassion, I mean, to truly feel that is uh, heartbreaking, really, because we can see the extent of cruelty and pain that um, we inflict on each other. But the fundamental resolution of that is um, you know, we can try to change our behavior. That's nice and it may have some limited benefit, but the, the only um, truly lasting resolution is to discover what we truly are. When we discover that, we discover what everyone else is as well. And from that understanding, um, there's really 
no alternative other than compassion and love.